my favorite place to live is zero to one, right? Give me the boulder that nobody else can move and let me try and push it up the hill. You know, that's where, that's where you learn to, you know, you really build the muscles and you learn to be, uh, you get smarter and smarter. Like I said, grow, uh, growing and learning, it's like the most important thing to me in life and, you know, improving who I am as a person. It, money is a byproduct of being great. I, and I truly believe that. So, you know, all I do is continually refocus on myself. Before we get started today, I wanted to give a special thanks to new sponsor, Hook Logistics. Hook Logistics is fulfillment without the fees, worry-free fulfillment for your cust transparent rates for you. They are a 3PL firm that's flipping the fulfillment business on its head with a simple concept, world-class fulfillment and transparent fair rates. On with the show. Hello and welcome to D2C Podcast. I am recording this time and I am super excited to have a friend and mentor of mine, Jason Akatif from A4D.com, uh, as well as a lot of other amazing enterprises. He's generated a quarter of a billion dollars in affiliate commissions throughout his storied career. Uh, he started even earlier than I did uh, in the affiliate marketing game and has been in e-commerce. He's been in uh, info and lead generation, all sorts of different areas. Uh, and I'm super excited to have him on today to talk a little bit about his perspective, about what's gone on during uh, these Corona times with the D2C e-commerce space, what's happening in the affiliate world right now. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about some of his high level business principles that he's going to be publishing on his blog. Uh, talk a little bit about lifestyle, because that's something everyone in the D2C space is interested in. Welcome to the podcast, Jason. How are you? Hey, I'm doing good, Eric. I, I really appreciate you. Really appreciate you having me on. Always, always a fun time to... Uh, to go and share uh, some of my learnings, you know, so much happens in a vacuum and, you know, you talk to your employees and your team and your partners every day, but, you know, it's, uh, it's often fun to come reflect on, on what's going on. Uh, as I said uh, on the last time, <laughs> you know, uh, I am working from home. I, I still am in my sweatshirt and stuff. If, if there's kids that come in, uh, much like, you know, most people, I, if there's any interruptions, I, I apologize uh, in advance for that. On the news, you know, you, you can get used to, you can allow it to happen on podcasts. So it's, it's happening to everyone now. I'm in my athleisure. Uh, KG is comfortable in his childhood bedroom in London, Ontario. Welcome also KG to the podcast of the newsletter. Uh, let's you. dive right in, Jason. What have you been up to, uh, let's say in the last seven months as an arbitrary number? Uh, and what are some of the key learnings that you've sort of generated in the space during that time? Um, yeah, uh, so... As I was saying, the the uh, it's a short period of time, but man, so much has changed so quickly, and and kind of the uh, perspective of the consumer, the conspect, you know, like as a business owner, um, you know, so so much has changed. So you know, if we want to talk about directly the the direct consumer space, the the what I consider the product brand space, um, you know, what in the very beginning, you know, we felt it before anything hit America, right? Because what happened is it hit China and they actually shut down all the supply chain. So all of our manufacturers closed. At that point, we were, we were doing direct injection into the US to serve most of our US customers on a somewhere between a six to 12 day delivery time. Um, so all of our, our 3PL, our third party logistics warehouse as well as our manufacturers shut down for almost two months. Now, meanwhile, uh, you know, that kind of started to, to, we didn't really, again, we didn't really see a lot of it here in the US. Then about a month after that, we started to uh, get some, you know, we started to get a lot, uh, a lot of it starting to happen here. All the New York stuff happened, the Italy stuff happened. I think there was a lot of fear. People were like, it's coming for us. And it, it really can change the consumer mind. And so then they really started buying stuff that they think they might need. Uh, so, so we saw an uptick in uh, sales, uh, uptick in conversion rates. And then once it actually hit our shores uh, and businesses started to close, offices started to close, people started to work from home. And more importantly, stores started to close. People could no longer go to a store to buy anything. Now, at the same time, typically with large businesses, 
Uh, they have budgets and forecasts and all this stuff. Um, and, you know, typically marketing is the first thing to get chopped from the budget anytime hard times are coming or hard times are predicted. So, so what ultimately happened there was we saw CPMs or cost per thousand impressions drop literally in half. And then at the same time, you've got this, um, you've got all the stores closed. So we saw conversions rates tick up 30 or 40%. And that's great. But we just a few months before had a supply chain issue and we couldn't, we couldn't get inventory here in time. Now, at the same time, China started to reopen, you know, they'd allow them to work a certain amount of hours a day and then whatever that, that finally repaired itself. But man, between all of this, well, actually there's another piece to this. So we started like once China opened back up, we really ramped up and scaled, but because how we do our shipping, which is basically, or how we used to do our shipping, we would pack a parcel, uh, with a label on it from our LA warehouse to the customer in China. And then we throw all that into an air freight carton and bring it over. Well, air freight actually happens almost uh, like, I think 80% of it comes in um, like uh, not, not actual cargo planes. It comes in the belly of just regular traveler planes, right? Like uh, passenger, passenger planes. planes. Yeah. So guess what? They stopped all the passenger planes. And so now our air freight costs tripled. And then also with all the PPE stuff that was going on, the, the personal protective gear, that is the masks, the, the goggles, whatever else, uh, that was like, they were trying to get so much of that to the US that it backed up all of customs on, on both sides. And ultimately we worked through Pitney Bowes at the time as our, as our US warehouse and um, they started getting COVID in their warehouses. So they were closing every two days. There was 7 million parcels uh, sitting in Pitney Bowes that had come in, not just ours, but other people as well. And they basically couldn't process them and ship them out. They'd open up for a day or two. Uh, it would, uh, you know, somebody would get COVID, they'd have to shut down for two days of, of disinfecting and decontaminating the, the area. And then they'd open back up and this, this continued on for about 30 days. And man, it, uh, it created havoc in uh, our customer experience, our chargebacks, uh, er everything was, was, a, was a total nightmare. Um, and honestly, I'm really, really glad to be through it. Um, the other piece of that is, you know, we sell primarily in the US is, is our largest market. Um, you know, right around when all that got sorted out, our Facebook pages scores started to get good again above four. Um, you know, we were, we got all our inventory onshore, uh, in our warehouses onshore so we could deliver fast again, right about that time, the election started and we've seen a, a creep up, up. And so, so slowly as you know, that had a hard dip in CPMs and then slowly as, as you know, people understood, Hey, this isn't going to be as bad. It's not the end of the world. So then we saw the CPM start to creep up. And then right about September, they had just got back to about the levels that they were the, the previous year in September. And then uh, our primary demographic is, uh, you know, 55 plus. Guess who the voters are? Uh, you know, nobody's spending any money uh, on Facebook advertising to 25-year-olds or they're not, not like they are 55-year-olds because... 55 year olds go to the polls. So then we see a massive spike in CPMs. What's that? <laughs> yeah. They have the money too, right? Generally. Right. So everyone's after them, even, even not in non-elective. Yeah. Election. Yeah. Times. Another thing interesting that we, you know, we've seen is you're seeing a lot of uh, manufacturers and large retailers starting to spend, you know, where they might've spent on PPE or pay-per-view uh, type stuff before uh, for brand awareness. Um, they're, they're getting much more active in the conversion targeting uh, that is direct to consumer. Uh, we, we've seen some brands come out lately from major 
companies, I think there was a toothpaste one, I don't remember whether it was Colgate or what other, with building their own D2C brands. There was a laundry detergent yeah. one building their own D2C brands, like from scratch, you know, they're, they're buying up D2C brands, but in addition, um, they, they're starting to understand the game and they're starting to understand that, that this is where the future is and more and more budget gets pushed into those conversion campaigns on Facebook specifically. This, this is what we found ourselves in the absolute middle of here. Like, you know, my time with iStack was all about the grassroots, all about helping people come up through affiliate marketing into different business models and things like that. But start with Pilot House and with D2C, Pilot House is working with such a high level of advertiser and our audience became this really high level of, of, of advertiser. And we've got the world's biggest Fortune 500 brands subscribing to this because they realize they see something that says learn D to C inside and out on their Instagram and they're subscribing like crazy. I won't say which company, but it, uh, one of these, the biggest companies in the world, we've been talking with quite a bit and they have this thing that's like an internal of for testing D to C products. They have like an internal dragon's den where they have pods of teams responsible for coming up with products. And then they pitch them in these like internally televised events where there's literally judges and they kind of go through this process for actually vetting. And I thought that was a really cool example of a le like as legacy a company as you can get, getting really scrappy and getting innovative with how it, it found new products and brought them to market. I was just wondering like with your business at this point, how much of it is um, your own products that you're promoting through your affiliate network versus other uh, uh, external products that your affiliate network is promoting? I mean, the affiliate network in general, uh, it's, well, the affiliate, so I have two companies, right? I have a for d which is the affiliate network. We also do a lot of internal media buying. We also have a lead generation division where we focus a lot on legal leads and um, other other lead verticals. And then I have another business called Jamiac where it's basically a platform uh, for D2C brands that we're both building and buying. Um, you know, that, that's all internal, probably only, 10% of, of the Jamiac traffic comes from uh, the a for uh, the a for company platform, whatever. And then, um, you know, in our internal products that is in the lead gen is probably another 50% and then 40% is, is third party to third party uh, legacy business that we've been in since, since 2008. Um, but yeah. Jason, I'm, where's I'm, your head these days? Where's my head? Yeah, where's your head in, in all of this, mostly? And then, then, then KG jump in. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I've been doing this for almost 20 years now. I, was, I started in uh, 2003 in direct-to-consumer, and I've been through Black Hat SEO. I've been in, you know, the early days of social marketing, the early days of display, the early days of DSP. Um, you know, I, I love the marketing aspect, but Honestly, a lot of where I, my time is going, it's going into the product company because those are, you know, owned and operated brands and customer experience and consumer journey and um, spending a lot of time on that side. But really in both of my businesses, I'm a strategist. Uh, you know, I'm no longer out with the bricks, you know, laying the road. You know, I have done pretty much all of that. If there's a new area we're going to get into, uh, I'm probably going to go dig into it. Like we're working on influencer stuff right now. I'll go find, you know, a really good leader to build a team under. And then I'll go dig in and understand how it all works, number one. And then, you know, really work through strategy on how to uh, optimize that. So, you know, a lot of my time on the A4D side, which isn't a, you know, a large percentage of the bulk of my time, probably 10, 20% at this point of my working time uh, goes to A4D, but it's much more me meeting with the leaders uh, in the organization and then asking the right questions and then doing a lot of, a lot of strategy, which is, is really my passion, right? I wanted to build larger businesses. Uh, you know, A4D does anywhere from 40 to 70 million a year in revenue and, and, and Jamiac will probably do 50 to 60 this year and targeting somewhere between 120 and 150 next year. Um, I want to build- How new is that? is that? Has that been around in the background for a long time or is it really new? Uh, I've been working on it for about three years. Okay, uh, pretty good. Lots and lots of mistakes, lots of learning. You know, we have a lot of our own technology and have solved a lot of problems through technology that allow us to scale. 
uh, both autom automation, some machine learning, some, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then just, there's, there's some very interesting problems to solve uh, because in a traditional e-commerce business or really any business, uh, revenue is recognized uh, when product is shipped, right? So all the costs that are involved, the revenue is recognized. Well, we come from a world where all decisions have to be made at time of order. Uh, all, you know, do I bid on this impression? Do I continue to buy against this uh, thing? And you know, we're, we still are a scrappy company in the sense that we want to make sure that we have profitability early. We don't, we don't have CPG budgets where Procter & Campbell can probably dump, you know, $20 million into a new initiative that can easily fail. And, you know, we're, we're very scrappy and still, you know, working. How do we scale massively, uh, you know, while breaking even or, or you know, not losing money uh, is ultimately the goal. Obviously, we want to make money, but at the same time, I don't want to pay taxes. So, you know, I, I kind of admire Bezos in the sense that, you know, they're like, why, why make a profit? If we make a profit, then we got to pay the government. Well, I guess he has strategies around that now too, but <laughs> I'm, I'm not as well as well uh, understood in that world as, as he is, but uh, ultimately, uh, you know, just trying to grow as fast as we possibly can. There, there is another interesting thing. Um, you know, we come out of the affiliate world, which is super scrappy and whatever, you know, and, you know, they're really looking at, uh, you know, how much can I make now? Um, and what cash flow and what am I going to put in my pocket? And they're ultimately not thinking about building something of value, uh, you know, versus everything we do now is about positioning and story and building value and, and so on and so forth. So. That's, yeah. So, um, so like a lot of, a lot of high level strategic stuff, that's kind of where your, your expertise seems to lie right now. Uh, I'm curious, I, I, I like, like strategies of, you know, a, obviously a big, big thing. Um, but what's, is there like one thing, one or two things that you find that a lot of people, when they're putting together strategies, they, they often overlook? Uh, I mean, there's, there's more of, there's not like one or two things, but there, there is a macro thing, right? So typically if you're going to build uh, a new division inside of an organization or a new company, right? You want to go get somebody that has already uh, done that from the size that you're at. And this is a mistake. I, I, I'm an advisor in a number of, uh, you know, fairly successful direct to consumer brands. Um, and, and I just advise people for fun because I really actually enjoy the strategy side of all this stuff. And I, I love sharing, you know, what I've learned through the process. Um, but the thing is a lot of time you need to, at least in my world, if I'm going to build an influencer division, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go hire somebody that's already built an influencer division. And you know, I think one of the one of the key things that I see people miss is it's like, well, I'm going to go hire this person, and you know, I'm going to go get somebody from Procter and Gamble who ran a 500 person influencer division of Procter and Gamble, let's just say, because look at the, look at the resume, look at the dossier of what this person has done. And, you know, maybe you have a one person in influencer division, maybe you have a zero person influencer division, maybe you have a 10 person influencer division and the skill sets to move from one place to the next, uh, you know, you, you can't take somebody from, from, that's built two influencer divisions from zero to 10 employees and put them in charge of a 500 person influencer division. And you can't go the other way either. So, you know, one of the key things that, you know, from strategy standpoint that I talk to a lot of my founders about that I work with is, you know, go look for somebody that's actually taken it from where you are to kind of what you can see. Uh, you know, I, I could see this growing to a, th and, it, and it very much has to do with management, headcount head structure, measurement, and, and stuff like that. And a lot of the people that come out of the affiliate world, you know, they're not process oriented people. So, you know, that doesn't, you know, they're very creative, they're very scrappy, they can figure stuff out, but then how do you productionize it? 
How do you turn it into something that you can do over and over again successfully and, and turn it into an overall win? Otherwise, you're just going to continually uh, butt your head against the wall uh, and it's not going to scale. So that would be the main one. I think, I think that's really good. And I think part of, of what is, is you mentioned earlier, which was how at this point you're, you're sort of this uh, you know, high-level strategy guy whenever you can be. But at the same time, when you're starting a new division, it's going to be you who kind of rolls up your sleeves. You're going to hire someone quick, but still taking, I, I think, leadership from the rear, uh, leading from the rear is something that I, I really admire about the way that uh, Kyle and Jeff uh, managed Pilot House and that they're still in the trenches figuring things out along the team. And I feel like when you grow a team fast, it's so important to see your charging alongside uh, you know, and, and I, it's cool to see that even, even at this stage, you want to hire someone who's in order to take over a new division, someone who's already been there, but it still also requires you in a way rolling your sleeves up and, and, and working with them, at least in the beginning to, to make sure it has the biggest impact. Yeah. There's, there's another piece of this, uh, that I've made the mistake of many, many times. And I, I try not to now, but I still continue to make the mistake. That is I hire somebody with, with the, with the resume and whatever, and I bring them in and I expect that they are going to do it as efficiently as, but like if they're a purchasing agent, they're going to negotiate the best terms. They're going to, you know, find the best vendors. They're going to do the best QC process on, on that stuff. Um, and, you know, typically somebody's going to do whatever they did before. So, you know, no matter what the resume is, if you hire somebody out of a, operational organization that even has a hundred people in it, the level of expectations and the scrappiness you need to make that stuff successful, you know, a lot of times they were just given a system or a process to operate from. And they're like, I just did the thing, right? And and this was the, you know, this is just status quo and how it was. And I think anybody that comes out that, that's been successful in the affiliate world or the scrappy direct to consumer world, um, you know, we're always looking to constantly improve. How do we get better terms? Well, it's and and you hear things like, well, that's just the way it is. And you know, China, you just do have to do a deposit, or in that number, maybe thirty percent you're going to hear, or fifty percent, and then you have to pay on delivery. That's just the way it is. I've worked at three other companies before, and you know, retraining and in, in where strategy comes in is, you know, you come in and you ask the question. All right, well, if you only had the option um, to do 20% deposit and then we want 80% to be on 60 day terms, what would have to happen? And this activates somebody's brain and somebody's mind. And it's asking the question from an assumptive close. So in sales, you have something called an assumptive close, which basically, you know, which package would you like? You know, you're just assuming that they want a package and you're, that's actually called the alternative close, but there's an assumption being made in there. Well, this is magical stuff that we can use on our own brains and get us to think, well, you know, I hate the cliche outside the box, but you know, that is getting people to think, how can we solve this problem another way? Just because that's the way it's always been done doesn't mean that is the most efficient. Somebody might go, hey, I have to raise capital. And I'll, the first question I'm like, tell me your terms with your vendors. Well, they're this, and that's just the way it is. I'm like, no, that isn't just the way it is. That's just the way it is for you. And you've actually boxed that out of your mind and that's not an option. So you're only chasing these rabbits down the other path, yet you know, everything is possible. And all facets of anything that you do should be constantly questioned. Um, you know, if we want to do this better, what could we improve? And with the assumption that everything everything is improvable and hiring lead, strong leadership from other organizations, especially you know as they get into their 40s and 50s, it takes some retraining of the brain uh, to ask these questions in this way because they've been doing something for for 30 years. So you know just things that I've I've learned through the process. Don't assume that people are going to look at problems no matter how high level or how much they teach you uh, about a facet of the business you know, don't assume that they are going to think about problems solving the way, the way that you do, but also listen to them at the same time, because they have a lot to contribute and teach you. Very cool. Totally. Um, yeah. Uh, hearing about the, you know, the assumptive close and, and sales uh, takes me back to, um, you know, uh, some of the first skills that I started learning um, as an entrepreneur and, um, 
and as soon as I, as soon as we, you know, had to sell stuff, I realized that I needed to learn how to sell because we weren't selling anything. So, um, it actually, it, I'd love to hear your, um, what, what concrete steps or, or skills, uh, would you recommend someone who's fresh to this space, who wants to build something similar to you, uh, what, and they're starting from scratch, what, what would you recommend they do? What, what are the first few steps? Oh, this is a, <laughs> this is a tough one. Um, you know, curiosity, you know, I, I don't know how somebody becomes curious about everything, but I, I think, you know, curiosity as a skill is so important. Um, and I, I can talk about some steps and, and stuff like that, but I think, you know, I've got to where I am, uh, Jim Rohn, not the sports announcer, but the, the motivational speaker that was the trainer of Tony Robbins. You know, he talks about working harder on yourself than you do in the business. And, and I really take this, this to heart. And, um, you know, for me, uh, happiness is uh, growth and learning. That is uh, uh, taking on very difficult things that I have no idea about and, you know, struggling with them for a period of time and then overcoming. And then I, I kind of see the world as a puzzle. And now I've got more pieces of the puzzle that I can understand how these, how these things interact. Um, but, but curiosity and, and looking at any facet of, of a business and saying, well, I want to learn about logistics or I want to learn about operational excellence or I, you know, so I'll go down a rabbit hole on podcasts or books on Six Sigma Black Belt, or maybe even take a course or uh, I'll go down a rabbit hole of whatever. And, and I think it takes all parts of the business uh, to, to really understand and, and make it, make it super successful and sustainable in the end, because you have to identify where the, the holes are in the business, you know, where, where your blind spots are, um, because your blind spots is ultimately uh, what puts you out of business. So, so that's number one. Um, now, if I were to start a D2C brand, I didn't know anything. Um, there's, there's two main parts that I think are, are really important. And of course, the, the two main parts have a massive amount of, of subparts. Uh, it's not really understanding Shopify. You can you can go get somebody out of India that really understands Shopify well, um, you know, and and puts that together. But it's rather uh, understanding where there's a gap in the market. Number one, right? So uh, if you look at the market and you say, okay, I want to start a, I don't know, I want to start a shoe brand. Well, where is there a silent majority? Uh, you know, as far as starting a shoe brand, where is there an underserved market, uh, you know, under silent majority that that is underserved. And, you know, I hate to bring up Trump, but, you know, he is one of the best marketers in the world, in my opinion, right? He, what he figured out was there was an unserved, uh, you know, voiceless majority within inside America. And all Trump does is pander to them. I, I don't actually Trust believe that, uh, you know, he believes half of the stuff that comes out of his mouth. But you know what, he's a marketer and a sales guy, and he knows exactly what to say to that base, yeah. right? And if, if I were to create a brand, I would look at, you know, people are like, ooh, this product is cool. Well, it all starts with your market and understanding, okay, well, I see, um, I see that this market, you know, most of the brands are positioned this way, but there's no bad boy brand, you know, in this market. Now, is there bad boys that um, like shoes? Well, yeah, of course, right? Uh, and, you know, probably John Barbatos, you know, was born out of that or, yep. you know, whatever other brands that are out there. So it's really understanding where there's a void in the market. You could say, okay, um, you know, find a, find a product, then, then it's like filling in the need is kind of that next step. Um, and understanding what products, one or two products that they would really like, uh, that would speak to them. And then kind of the next step from there, uh, to really get good at is, is learning how to market that is build ads and speak to that market and this kind of stuff. You know, I, you know, there's a lot of ways to generate traffic. There's a lot of ways to generate momentum. Some of them are, are, are free and slow. And it's just, 
some of them are fast and cost a lot of money. And, you know, it, it really has to do with what budgets are available, what aptitude you have to, uh, you know, s spend that money and solve those problems. But from, from my perspective, uh, you know, I started in black hat SEO and then kind of did some white hat SEO. Then I did started doing some social stuff. And then ultimately I, I wound up, uh, uh, you know, buying media, buying ads, because I could get the most predictable, scalable results consistently buying ads. So I really honed my craft starting in about 2006, buying ads on um, Google on their display network when that rolled out, and then Facebook, which was called Facebook Flyers before it was Facebook ads, which was just ads on the right hand side of the news feed. And the list goes on of, of all the other platforms that that rolled out. But, you know, for me, I was like, well, this is interesting. I could spend $50,000 a day in media. And if as long as I had a calculated return, I'm profitable. So, you know, and, and what was even better is, you know, I started in the affiliate world. And the affiliate world is like, here's a page and here's a dollar amount that we're going to pay you to generate a sale. Now, most other people would look at this out of any other side of business world and go, so they fire the pixel and tell you when they're going to pay you and you don't own the customer and the list goes on of a million really bad things about being an affiliate. But at the same time, I believe it's the most true form of, uh, of direct response uh, online stuff. And because you don't have to worry about customer service or anything else, it's okay, I get $70 if I generate a sale for this. And so I'm going to build the ads and then work on, maybe I need to put a landing page in front of that that's got uh, some kind of an angle bridge or I figure out an angle. It's the truest sense of marketing where if you're trying to learn how to run ads and you're running a Shopify store, that gets tough because you've got to manage the customer service. You've got to manage the supply chain. You've got to manage the logistics. You've got to actually work on the store. Uh, you've got to think about the product catalog and you, you get very, it's, it's much more burdensome and much more difficult to kind of hone that craft. And I am, one thing I am is a huge advocate of anything, you know, I think a skill is developed by repetition, reflection and pivoting and then doing it again. And as an example of this, you know, somebody says they want to learn sales. I'm like, okay, cool. Go work on a call floor. And it's like, well, I don't want to be a call floor rep. You know, that that's a, those people are whatever, right? And they, there's a, you know, perception of, of who, the, who those humans are. But guess what? You're going to take a hundred phone calls a day. And after each of those phone calls, you reflect and you, you work a strategy and you go home and you read your sales book every night, somewhere in 30 to 60 days, you're, there, there's a, a hockey stick of, uh, of uh, skill development that goes kind of like this, struggle, struggle, struggle. Then you start to go like this. Then you get to the top of the hot, hockey stick and you start to go like this. Well, in 60 days of 100 calls a day, studying a, studying a sales book of strategies of closes and this and that and constantly trying that and looking how to improve it, you're going to develop that skill much like a muscle in 60 days. Now, if you want to go be a realtor and learn how to sell, well, how many customers are you going to talk to and how many closes are you going to have an opportunity to do? And this is the same thing with marketing. And that's why I think that, you know, still affiliate marketing is still a great way to kind of box it and learn in a very quick fashion. Love that. Yeah. And that's um, what we used to say at I, at I, I stack all the time as well is that you get like before you take on the, the the whole brand building side of things uh you take on you know you just you isolate that media buying thing you get ruthless about it, it and you really understand performance it's interesting when you're talking about hiring people about how you, you're in a, you want to find like a hybrid you want to find someone who understands enough to be curious about every aspect of an offer and every aspect of a campaign so that they can uh put it together and get creative and, and really find those performance gains but at the same time you need them to have a mindset of growth and being able to build things assemble teams that don't always come easy to affiliates who are kind of really thinking in the and moment these, Eric, often. Eric, these aren't these are these are often not the same people, no, right? So rarely. A lot of time, I I build yeah I build a like a team like I've got an innovative innovator you know person that's been in the trenches for years. But then when we go to build a department, I'll I'll go get somebody that's maybe they're not anything like this, but they they have some experience. But they're really good at building teams. They're very good at the operations. They understand how to scale that stuff, right? 
So, and then have those two people to work together because, you know, say we've got a 30 person team. Well, the person that loves solving problems does not want to manage and run that team day to day, manage them to KPIs, be concerned about those staff members growth and where they want to go. They just want to solve problems and then feed the person that runs the team that solves the problems. So that's kind of most of the time how I think about uh, developing a department structure. And some, sometimes that strategy person is me. And sometimes that strategy person is somebody we bring in that's, uh, you know, really amazing at figuring stuff out. So nice. KG, and, um, I, and our, I stepped over you last time. Oh, it's okay. I was, we were, we were actually just talking on, uh, before this call about like how a lot of people are often folks will talk about exponential growth, but um, at the same time, no one's talking about the hill and how the hill is logarithmic. So it's like, like you can have growth like this, but the hill is really hard at first and then it gets easier and easier and easier. Um, in your experience, is that, has that been true? Things just really hard at first and then gets a bit easier? I mean, with skill development, a thousand percent, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Tony Robbins talks about, you don't know what you don't know to start, then you move to, you, do, you, you, know, you know it, but you don't know how to do it. Then you start to become consciously competent. That is, you have to think about it and every action. And then at some point it's just innate. Right. So, you know, totally skill development is not necessarily getting it to the innate level. And, you know, at least for me, I never want to be the watchmaker. Um, that is the guy that's done it for 30 years. And, you know, he, he got here and then he got here. And now, now he's like this much better than any that's taken the other 25 years, mm -hmm. you know, and he's yeah. the best in the world at that thing. But, you know, for me, it's all about this part. And then as soon as this starts to happen, I want to go learn another skill set. That's me. Now, with company growth and company development, you know, it's all a factor of, of time and goals, right? I, I am a firm believer of everything is possible if you give it enough time. And, you know, if you want to cram the time down, this is where stress is created. This is where, so, you know, it's really understanding what that timeline is that's within reason, but also is accelerated because a lot of times you'll get people out of corporate America and they want this timeline and because everybody's nine to fivers and, you know, whatever, right. And they come in and they punch the machine and they do put, move the part to the next thing and whatever. Um, you know, we're, we're mostly entrepreneurial and scrappy within our culture. So we're constantly, comp I'm like, okay, well, if we could do it in half the time, you know, again, backing back to those questions, let's just say we could do it in half the time, what would have to happen, get their brain to start to rewire a bit to, to understand, but, um, you know, growth typically in an organization goes like this, and then maybe it goes like this a little bit. And then, you know, if it's a good organization, it, it dips while you reset. And you know, you you've had this tremendous growth, and you broke a bunch of stuff, and you need to reset a little bit, and then it starts to starts to go up again. Uh, my CTO, COO calls it build up and break through, right? Build up, build up, build up, break through. But then, you know, at some point, you also need to go back and kind of refactor what you're doing and understand. Okay, so if we're to triple this, what's going to break, and really think through those next steps of the process. Yeah. Uh, I, one of the things that you it really came uh, across to me in the very in that very first show that you spoke at at Berlin at the iStack event there was just urging a lot of people to think bigger in this space, yeah. urging a lot of people to to not just you know not not just eke out a lifestyle business necessarily, but to build a business that you know that, that you, you can you know stake your on essentially. I, I'm just wondering like what I. I and now for you, that play really is this brand building enterprise. It's, it's acquiring brands and it's, and it's building in, internally. What, what do you look for in, in brands? Like, what do you look for in brands that you're acquiring? How, when do you know that you need to, to acquire a brand? Uh, it's an interesting time right now, you know, because there is some, some businesses, you know, I'm typically buying distressed brands at this point, um, you know, like a, a business that was doing well last year, maybe they took on too much debt and, you know, their, their business has slowed a little bit this year and that debt payment has become too burdensome. And then, you know, I'm going in and negotiating with the, uh, with the note holders uh, if they have a UCC filing secured against that, that asset. Uh, if and then buying the buying the assets out of the company and then cr rolling it into a sub wholly owned subsidiary of of the primary company. That's kind of my process right now. Okay. Um, 
but there's a lot of different ways you can look at it depends on what your strategy is you know we're not at the point right now where we can uh consolidate revenue so if you look at uh thras io if, if you guys are familiar with them and what they're doing they've raised 370 million to this point i you know they're they're raising another huge tranche right now i think they've rolled up about a billion dollars in revenue and really their goal is just to roll up revenue you know and continue to scale that company exponentially and typically when you talk to bankers and we can get into private equity and all that kind of stuff as well you know they're they're like what percentages build and what percentages buy and then what's your what's your exit strategy are you going to go ipo are you going to go uh you know uh, reverse merger are you going to sell to uh, are you going to sell to a PE fund that's maybe going to continue the growth and flip you? Like, what is the uh, what is the target? So you, you can't really speak to uh, who do you want to buy until you actually know, you know what you're trying to accomplish. So we're still in first steps. We've done our first acquisition. I've talked to two other companies that we're potentially going to be uh, picking up the assets out of. Um, you know, and it's, it's really amazing when you get a great founder that comes with it. So like in, in acquiring Baobox, uh, you know, the, we get the founder who raised 9 million on Kickstarter. So now we've got an amazing Kickstarter person to, for our new product launches. So that's super fun. And then we also, uh, picked up his logistics and supply chain guy that knows the RPs really well. That's, you know, kind of leading the, uh systemization so like on our logistics side we've got a guy that kind of figures everything out like you're talking about strategy wise and then now this guy will play the role of you know building a whole team and make sure that the trains run on time and and all that kind of stuff so you know it's kind of fun that you pick up pick up great people through that process and you know for us we'll we'll do a couple of smaller acquisitions see how we integrate them see how we integrate their revenue see integrate them into our technology and our kind of federated service for media buying and ad creation and all these kind of things. Uh, and then, you know, potentially go look at doing a, a revenue roll up play in the, in the direct to consumer space once we're comfortable uh, that we can execute that well. Very cool. Awesome. And we, and we, um, so we understand that you're, you're working on, um, on some, some principles, some business principles, and, and maybe, maybe you've already, uh, like revealed some of them, some of them to us. Um, but uh, I'm wondering if you could just tell us a bit about um, about a bit about what what inspired that, and if you could, you know, take us through some of those principles. Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, what initially inspired it was, you know, I guess there's the manifestation of the actual thing, and then there is what happens. I mean, as a as a business leader, as a mentor, you you wind up saying the same things over and over again, and and really the magic of all of that stuff is how do you take something super complex and simplify it down to seven words, right? And um, a lot of times I, you know, because I do run two companies, I, you know, I do a lot in real estate, you know, I have a family, I vacation probably 100, 120 days a year uh, as well. Um, you know, I need to be able to answer things very quickly and succinctly um, and, uh, you know, I, I saw myself doing it and actually that's why I originally started jasonactive.com was because people kept asking me the same question. So, you know, if I, two people would ask me the question in a row, I'd go, I'd go write a, an article about it. Um, but even that takes too long. I, I probably haven't written anything there in a year and a half. Uh, so, you know, then what we did in our company, we didn't have any core values inside of A4D. And then we went away and we spent a bunch of time and we built uh, 10 core values inside of A4D, you know, uh, make data driven decisions, be humble. Um, you know, these are just a, a few of our core values there. And then we tie everything we do inside the organization back to the core values. And what this allows to happen is people can make decisions without you. And it's, you know, nobody ever gets reprimanded if they're like, hey, I made a data driven decision and it didn't work out. It's like, great. As long as you, you know, are following these core values, you know, here's a bonus, right? <laughs> you, you actually get a bonus, even though it didn't work out for taking the risk and, you know, making sure you follow the, the core values. Like another one of our core values is it's, a, it's okay to fail as long as you 
uh, give 100%. So, you know, don't, don't try something half-assed, like go all in, assume it's going to work. And if it fails, it fails, but just don't go in and be like, oh, I'm going to try this and see if I can maybe make this campaign work. It's like, either believe it's going to work or believe it isn't like Yoda says, what is it? Try, do or do not. There is no try. Right. Um, kind of following under that same, that same tenant. So, you know, that happened in my life. And then kind of the next stage from there was I read Ray Dalio's book principles, which is really, really a tremendous book. It's a heavy read. So you gotta, if you're not going to sit down and it's like a, a short story, you know, there's like so much, uh, depth of, of information in there. I read that. Um, a lot of his principles are very in alignment with, with my principles. Um, and then at one point, like I, I just, I was flying to Thailand to, I don't know, one of the stack that money events or something like that. And I couldn't sleep and I tossed and turned for hours. And then I was like, I would think about this and I would think about that. And then it all rolled back to these, these basic principles. And so then I pulled out uh, Google notes on my phone and I started writing down principles uh, on that flight. And I came up with about 120 principles that I operate from, um, you know, just, just very, very basic tenants, uh, you know, and they, again, they all boil down to just a few words and, and simplicity. Uh, let me pull up my list and I'll, uh, I'll share a few with you. Give me just a half a second here, guys. You can. We'll coordinate this launch with your blog post. We could even, and we could take maybe not all 120. We'll see. We'll see how many words there. But if if we we would be awesome to take your blog post and republish it in the newsletter as well, potentially. Of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I could definitely do that. Uh... We haven't even mentioned champagne yet. This is one of my favorite things about Jason Akatif is the number of times. This is one of the (laughs) few times that I've seen him without some bottle or flute of champagne. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> what's, what's your what's your favorite? You got a favorite? Uh, Runart. I, I love a Runart Blanc de Blanc is is my favorite. So, all right, guys. Nice. Let's so, hear. So, basically, I've I've built the the business principles and the and the personal principles into into separate stuff, and you know, keep in mind these are very personal to me. This isn't like I'm. Tr- I never had any intention of publishing these things. It was more just for me to operate from and get clarity on what I was doing and then also be able to internally communicate them, uh, you know, to the team so they understand what, what principles I operate from. So, you know, I say that because, you know, some of these, maybe, maybe somebody doesn't have the same belief, but a couple of like the personal ones, um, you know, I can build anything I set my mind to no matter how big. I am a builder, like that's who I identify with as, as a person. So anything that doesn't include building, that is maintaining, uh, that is uh, selling, selling companies. I can't, like I buy cars um, and then I'm like, I don't know. I, I just want to give it away. Cause I, I don't, I don't like, uh, I don't like selling things. I don't like endings yeah I'm, I'm all about building creating and uh b- doing things that that other people haven't been able to do or or are new and different uh, that are kind of an offshoot um so that's one another one for nice. me is build, be efficient in your solutions and help and you know i t- even talked about that a little bit just before right like People come to me all the time and ask me questions and I need to be able to answer them in a few lines because I, I just don't have enough time to, um, you know, sit down and have a long discussion. So, you know, how do you, how do you synthesize long winded answers down to what is the core of what's going on, which is, which essentially, um, you know, is, is what is, you know, uh, revolve around. There's, there's a bunch of them, but, you know, when I get into, into the business side of things, uh, you know, my number one, so I bucket these into vision and planning, process, uh, HR and culture, and tech and tech development, and then miscellaneous. So the number one on my list uh, for business right under vision and planning is never build for cash flow alone. Always build for cash flow and value creation. You'll make a lot more with a lot less taxes selling what you've built if executed right. So uh, at least in California, we pay 53% taxes between state and federal. Uh, Capital gains, I believe is 30, 
thirty-five uh, percent there. So you know you'll pay less taxes on the on the capital gain side of things. In addition to that, you know a lot of businesses, and I've talked with a lot of people that have sold businesses. They're like, "Wow, you know I built this company. You know it was great. It made me a couple of million dollars a year." Then I went and sold that business for $60 million to a strategic buyer that really needed us as a puzzle piece to fit into to what they're doing. And I executed that business for six years. You know, it was really hard in the beginning. I maybe made $8 million over those six years. And really I had that win, that payday uh, at, the, at the end of the process. And, you know, this, this all came about, like uh, we got sued by the Federal Trade Commission back in 2012 uh, for being in the middle of, uh, some some stuff that, that was you know against consumer policy, and you know ultimately you know we were a network that sat in the middle of that, and and we got our hands slapped and and paid a fine to the FTC. Um, you know after that happened, uh, you know I could have continued to do things that were kind of tangential to that world and continued to to push forward, but for me I was like you know what. Uh, you know, I had a hard thought about, well, you know, maybe I should just sell A4D and go do something different. And I looked at A4D as a, as a company, you know, 95% of our revenue went away um, because I made the decision to, to stop playing in that space altogether. And uh, basically from then I was like, well, A4D is relatively worth nothing. You know, maybe it's worth uh, a few hundred thousand bucks as a, as a brand in the, in the affiliate world. And from that day forward, I, I had told myself, never again, I will never work on something that is not sellable. Uh, it does not create enterprise value. It does not create uh, good customer experiences uh, and so forth. And, and I've really executed from that standpoint. I think that's a great uh -huh. principle for the audience. And I feel like, and that you came by that so honestly, having built up one of the largest affiliate networks in the world, like that really is the affiliate network model. It's just pass through revenue. Everyone in your company sees that revenue though too. And that's why you get ego issues in affiliate marketing companies. You see the huge financial impact, but you're just skimming a portion of it in the middle. So it, yeah, it, 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 when, you, when you don't think about it the right way, it can definitely lead you. Uh, I fully agree with that. I mean, with that that happened, you know, it spawned, uh, I don't even remember the company names, but Peter Nguyen Company, C5, Jumbleberry, Oasis, all these companies basically went and took all that business that, that we gave up and a couple of other companies gave up because we didn't want to be in that space anymore. Um, and I, I had zero regrets. It wasn't like, oh, I wish I could be doing that. I, I really understood that they're, you know, at the core, there there's a better way. And I, I'm... I don't need to be in the the quick money world. It just, you know, and and kind of disappointed that I that I ever was. But you know, it taught me a lot of things, and and that's where I started. You, you um, remind me of something that Hitchcock said to me one time, right? When I was I was getting into this job and uh, uh, with, with Pilot House, and I had this great opportunity, and he was sort of saying like, oh, even if because he was like, even if shit hits the fan, he's like, we'll just figure out something else. We'll just, and I feel like you've done that so many times as a, as someone who leads from the rear as well, in that you you hit a wall but you're able because you're in the trenches and you're, you're going to just find something else. You're, you're going to be able, and I feel like you've reinvented the business like multiple times now. And especially since you have reinvented it always with that idea of, of equity. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and, and honestly, that's where I love to live. I'm my favorite place to live is zero to one, right? Give me the boulder that nobody else can move and let me try and push it up the hill. You know, that's where, that's where you learn to, you know, you really build the muscles and you learn to be, uh, you get smarter and smarter. Like I said, grow, uh, growing and learning, it's like the most important thing to me in life and, you know, improving who I am as a person. It, money is a byproduct of being great. I, and I truly believe that. So, you know, all I do is continually refocus on myself to and not, not from an ego standpoint, but rather what skill set do I not know? What could I learn? Let me go take on a new challenge. And, and I really love that process. And speaking of uh, skill sets and muscles, uh, I know we really want to hear a bit about your uh, your vacationing uh, skill set, uh, given that you do it for about 120 days a year. Um, so uh, I think we'd love to, you know, before we wrap up here, we'd just love to hear a bit about 
uh, you know, how you're, how you're able to take, because I know a lot of entrepreneurs, even if you say, here's 120 days to take off, they probably wouldn't. And so, you know, how you, how you're able to do that and, and, and what you do during that time. Sure. Um, it all goes back to my, to my core beliefs and, you know, these principles that I'm, that I'm talking about. And one of my beliefs is if you are in the business all the time, you're constantly micro correcting your leaders. And what I mean by that is you're like, okay, let's do this thing. And then, you know, if you're there, you know, kind of overseeing stuff, uh, they don't have true autonomy to make mistakes. And, you know, I, I want them to make mistakes and learn from them. Granted, I want to give them guidance from time to time, but I really want them to own the outcome of what they're creating. That is building their team, building the systems and, and so forth. We've got great people strategically inside of the company to help them in that, in that endeavor. Um, but you really need to leave them by themselves to allow them to uh, you know, grow that on their own without your, without your interference for, for periods of time, then this is how you, it's kind of like training wheels. This is how you get them to really take ownership of things. So my general process is I come into the business. I look for some opportunities that we could be, we could be improving things and, and doing them better. Then I work with that leader to put some processes in place that is, hey, we should look at this or we should look at that or maybe we should do this and here's some ideas on how we could solve that problem. Then I let them own building that system, the measurements and whatnot. Then I work with them a little bit as it's kind of spinning up. And then uh, as soon as they, you know, it's just time to take those training wheels off on whatever that thing is, um, that's when I go on vacation and I leave for a week or two because now, that gives them the opportunity to, to make that thing go. Now I go back uh, after whatever that time off is, sometimes it's a week, sometimes it's a month, and I look at all the, and, and I start this process all over again. And this is, uh, you know, I talk about spinning the plates. Like we, I, you know, I go in, I get the plate spinning and then I leave and then I see what plates fall when I'm gone. You know, hey, maybe we need to hire a person to handle this part because this seemed to stop working. And the, the process for me to actually be able to do this, and granted, the more you do things, the more comfortable you get with them was, you know, back in the day with A4D, I'd go on vacation for a few days, I'd come back and, you know, things might not be running as, as well as they were and the revenues might be down, then it was a week. Uh, so, you know, kind of goal one was to get things to stay stable uh, with me leaving for longer and longer periods of time. And then the next step from there is actually, how do you get growth? Uh, how does the company continue to grow even though you're not in it, working on it day to day? Um, how do you just work on strategy and then let the people that are operating the systems that are created inside of the company uh, actually take on, take on the responsibility of growth so that when you leave uh, and come back a month later that the company is more successful? A little bit easier said than done, but and it does take time and it does take iterations, um, but it is, it is a very rewarding endeavor because at the end of the day, you get to a place where you can do whatever you want. If you want to work in the business, you can, but you don't have to. Uh, and I think there's a lot of people, especially early entrepreneurs, uh, even as much as a 50 to 100 per people company that that don't do this process and you know they're they're going home stressed every night um you know and and i definitely you know i, I live a fairly stress-free life even though we're in a fast-growing company building things quickly um you know i just uh i just don't worry about much you know i just assume we're going through a process and it's and it's an iterative process so and you have so many of the right people plans. in place and you know so many people in the right place that you've hired over the years that you that you've built up this level of confidence in that obviously helps things as well what is what's your favorite vacation you took in in 2020 so far uh we went to uh croatia uh we did a 150 foot yacht in croatia with some friends uh croatia was open for the us and uh ironically enough i i got COVID on that yacht. Somebody, oh, somebody no. had brought Croatia or uh, brought COVID onto the yacht, but it it was still amazing. Uh, you know, I kind of laid on the on the day beds on the top, and we floated around the 
you know, captains drove us wherever and you know, just kind of fell asleep. I was, I got really tired. Uh, I was sleeping like 16, 18 hours a day and uh, didn't eat much, but, uh, and had a fairly deep cough. But, you know, other than that, it, it didn't bother me too much. So yeah, I was tired and lazy, but I was on a yacht floating around in, in Croatia. So now what sounds I'm like you, most... uh, you did COVID the right way. That sounds yeah. like COVID the right way. Yeah. I, well, I'm also, imp- I need your mastermind on not only 120 days of vacation, but at least I, I bet like half of those with your friends and not, I love traveling oh, yeah. with my family. I love traveling with my family too, but like getting away with your friends is that much better. I feel like you've almost got that. Well, I mean, my, my friends are business, yeah, right? That's true. So, yeah, that's the key. You know, I had a challenge in that, you know, a lot of the people that I grew up with, you know, they have a regular job and I'm, I'm a boss, right? So I, I view the world through a different lens and, you know, I love having conversations like this and, you know, they, it's very difficult to have conversations like this uh, with your friend group that maybe, you know, they, they work at some kind of an auto place or they work at, uh, whatever. And then, you know, typically it, it falls on, it falls to politics or, or something like that with that friend group. And then you look, you just look at things through it, through a different lens. Like I look at the uh, geo worldwide geopolitical situation and why do we make decisions like what we do in the Middle East and, you know, you know, they're maybe nationalistic and they don't, they don't understand that, you know, uh, they live a certain life and, and China and Russia, you know, left to their own devices, uh, you know, we are not, we would not be okay, right? We can see they're already trying to take over other parts and other countries and whatever. If we just said, hey, we're going to pull all of our, our missiles out, you know, it is a, it is a defensive ploy uh, in some ways. It's not to say that, that the U.S., uh, you know, doesn't have some, you know, things that they shouldn't be doing they definitely do but it's all it's all a a game to kind of keep keep table stakes where they're at we had a lot of uh relative peace when when china and and russia you know didn't have any money the ussr broke up china was in a very bad place but we can see as they become real dominant world powers again you know china's actively growing the largest military in the world they're you know shipbuilders and everything else yeah. missiles and nukes and because that's how the game is played so you know ultimately if you're like hey we're going to pull all our missiles out of uh, out of the middle east well guess where those missiles are pointed they're pointed at russia yeah. And, you know, there's a standoff between the two countries. So, but anyway, so I, I had it's to have just a discussion other, with, other dialogue. I, had, you know, I know exactly what you mean. And I, I had to have this discussion with my brother the other day because he started bringing up like, uh, and it, this podcast is not for politics. This is the most politics we'll ever talk on this podcast. We want to, I really want to do another podcast <laughs> yeah. about your geopolitical worldview because I think we can go deep on that. But I was having a conversation with my brother. Yeah. And he was complaining about Trump taking his mask off on the balcony or Trump taking that, that waving tour that endangered people or whatever. And I'm like, man, I just can't talk because I, I can't talk with people anymore about propaganda talking points, whatever they are, what, you know, whatever it is, right. it's like, those aren't the things that matter. The things that matter are these big geopolitical things. And I'm really interested in discussing those things, but it's hard to, it's hard strategy. to get on those things, of course. Back, back strategy, to the exactly. strategy, like every, none of those people are doing things for no reason. There is exactly. literally strategy behind every single word that comes out of Trump's mouth, every word yep. that comes out of Biden, every word that comes out of the Clintons and anybody else, right? They all have every strategy. digital fly that appears on a head, or whatever. Right. <laughs> or whatever. And I just, I, I just have such a passion for strategy, like anything yeah. that gets involved with, like. I'm not, a, I, I think there's things that both sides do that are really good. And I think there's things that both sides do that are really terrible, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I, but anyone I interested in this to find the documentary on YouTube called The Trap. And it's literally about how game theory was used uh, in the 50s and 60s to dictate all political actions. Every action that politicians were taking were dictated by these advanced computer simulations about game theory about, and, and if you don't think that's happening on a quantum level now, you know what I mean? We're, we're and using social now. media as a mechanism to to make it at, at a much greater scale, right? The feedback, and getting that fit. feedback loop. Are, yeah, yeah, already. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> the hair standing up on the back of my neck. We've run long. This will be the longest podcast we've had so far. We'll have you on again soon, Jason. I want to thank you for taking the time to come on, and it's been great to catch up. Uh, well, yeah, we're going to keep you posted on what we're, we're diving headlong into the influencer marketing world. 
uh, with a product that we're creating. So I will be hard selling you on that in the next little while, knowing that you're getting in the influencer space as well. Uh, yeah. Thanks sure. again, man. This has been great. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. I really, really appreciate it. I, you know, always these things, it's like, there's like 7,000 things we could talk about and we could go on for probably days and days and days of all kinds of crazy conversations, uh, you know, but it, it's always great to get to share some. So. All right. Well, and when you do release your you. blog post, we will definitely link out to it. Uh, and yeah, everyone, if everyone, if people want to get in touch with you, what, what's your, the medium of choice right now? Are you a Twitter guy? Or are you, what do you suggest? Uh, yeah, I'm on, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. Uh, email is typically not my medium of choice, but I do have an email. Um, you know, it's on my website, jasonactive.com. If you want to go there, uh, whatever, I'm, I'm always happy to talk shop. I love anything strategy or I love anybody that even comes to me and they're like, Hey, I've got this problem. Like, don't tell me I want to make money on the internet. Say, I, you know, my ads are doing this and this is the metrics and this is this. And it's like, okay, turn this lever and it's probably going to work for you. And I, I, I still enjoy, you know, that process so for nice. helping anybody. You're a hacker at heart. Awesome. I am. Nice. Okay, cool. cool well, next time I see you'll be in person so much, and we will be having some champagne. I can't wait. Cheers. Take care, guys. Bye, guys. Awesome. Bye. Thanks, Jason. Bye. Well, that was fantastic, Kyle. Uh, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast uh, today as well. And I want to do a quick plea to everyone out there to ch go to directtoconsumer.co to sign up for the newsletter if you haven't yet. It's a free newsletter. It's 3,000 words of our high-level uh, ad insight and creativity and blood and sweat going into every issue. Uh, we're ex excited to release some, some new stuff on influencers coming out soon, so you'll probably be hearing about that already. And if you haven't yet, check out our sponsor, Hashtag Paid. Hashtag Paid is the premier influencer marketing platform, can take care of everything that you need uh, to get connected with influencers, whitelisting and blacklisting campaigns of them. We're going to be talking about them more soon, as well as kickfurther.com. Check them out. Uh, they are an amazing funding that allows you to get your uh, your inventory costs partially covered by uh, investors. Uh, it's a really interesting thing. And they're offering a quarter of a million dollar uh funding draw that's happening in a few weeks so go to kickfurther.com and check them out yeah those are my ad reads for tonight uh and we got still got jason here yeah i'm still it's, here i was just listening this is gonna be a full half an hour i love it okay any anything else to add kyle uh, uh nope that okay. all sounds great all right thanks everyone okay See you guys. Bye, guys.